This is the second of a series of videos for the Crayford Manor House Astronomical Society members who wish to use the Dick Chambers Observatory to observe exoplanets using 16 inch LX200 telescope. In this part, we're going to introduce you to a piece of software called Nina. It has this little um, icon here, and we will put it on the observatory computer down here as well. You click on it, it takes a while to load. Now, when Nina first launches, it doesn't connect to all the equipment. But the position you really want to be in is all the equipment is turned on and ready to use. The observatory has been opened and Keith's dome buddy is engaged and pointing in the same direction as the telescope. So let me take you through Nina. Nina is going to look pretty complicated to start with. Um, you have these tabs down here, which I'll explain in a second. And then, then these tabs in this column here change or disappear completely based on the tabs you are on on these okay so on equipment this is all about connecting equipment you can also use this tab to actually control the equipment but we're not going to do that um, it's not how i use it but we will connect the equipment so we're going to start with a camera and it's showing the last camera that was connected, which is my um, CMOS sensor. If there are other cameras, it will list them. So I'm going to connect the camera and you can see a load of things have happened. Down in the right hand corner, it tells us that the camera has connected successfully. This will disappear on its own, um, but I'll close it for convenience. It gives you some specs about the camera. We don't really need to worry about any of this. It just auto populates it all. Um, possibly the most important thing on this page, I think, is the cooling. I always operate my camera at minus 10 degrees centigrade um, because I know I can reach that even when it's 24 degrees at night outside, it will get to minus 10. Um, so the first thing that I do is I turn on the cooler because the cooling can take 15, 20 minutes to get down to temperature, especially if it's 25 degrees outside. So I start that off running. And this here will tell you the cooler temperature and you'll slowly see it dropping. And you can see this graph here is the cooler power and it's showing the power on the cooler starting to increase. And we will eventually see this graph start to come down until it gets to minus 10 degrees. That's all you need to do on this page. If for some reason it doesn't connect, there's this refresh button and it'll let you refresh the list of cameras in here and then you can try connecting again with the connect button. When it is connected, this icon here changes and it has this little power logo beside the icon. So the next one down is the filter wheel. We need to connect the filter wheel as well and I the same thing applies here. It already auto populates the filter wheel, so you shouldn't need to change this, but you can see a list. Now you can actually download this Nina software, it's completely free, and you can um, set it up on your own computer with simulation devices. You know, like for instance, here, this filter wheel simulator or this simulator here. And you can have a play with it using simulators. I'm in my observatory. I've turned all the telescope on. It is daytime, but um, let's not worry about that. And let's connect. That's connected. And you will see a list of filters in the right hand side. You can select the filters here and change it, but we're not going to. We're not going to use this page at all. But it's just nice to know that on the equipment tab, you can actually interact with all the equipment if you want to. You can see now the filter wheel has this power icon sign. Now we'll do the focuser. Now my focuser is slightly temperamental. I, I haven't actually installed the software they told me to install. I haven't got around to doing it. And as a result, it doesn't always connect first time, but we'll give it a go. If it doesn't connect, you'll see, here we go. You can see what happens. Um, you'll get this error. Now this basically means it's not connected to the filter wheel. You can see that none of this has been populated. So we'll close this. It just means I can't focus. I know that if I now try to connect again, it almost certainly connect and it, and it has. This is why I've not 
quite got round to fixing the um, the software on my computer because it's so easy just to hit it twice. So again, there's a load of bump here. If you've got a temperature sensor, it will tell you what the temperature is of the focuser and um, you can move the focuser in and out here. But again, we're not going to use this page to manage the focuser. We don't have a rotator, so we're not going to touch that. We do have a telescope which we need to connect. And this will um, show the driver that you're using. So I'm using um, the Cytec D2 telescope driver for my Nessu Mark II mount. We click connect. You can see what's happened here is it's launched the um, Mesu driver, which we don't need to worry about because you won't have one of these. You'll have um, the Mead version of um, an ASCOM driver for the telescope. We can just ignore it, pop it into the background. We can set the tracking rate here. Again, we're not going to touch any of the things on this page. We don't need to. Um, but you do have a stop button here. You can unpark it here. You've got north, south, east, and west. You can move it here. Um, you can do stuff here, but we're not going to really touch any of this. You can see there's a load of data here telling you the altitude of the telescope. Mine's parked at the moment, and this is where it, where I have it parked. It's just giving you some information. And you can see that we've now got this little icon to show that it's connected. Then got the guider. We're going to connect that. This should be set to PhD2 because that's the guider that we will be using on the observatory computer. I'm just going to hit power and it will launch the guiding software. Now we're not actually going to interact with this guiding software. So you can see it's connecting to the amount automatically. Um, it's connected to the camera on the guiding software automatically. It says the guide is connected. We can disconnect that and we can just minimize it. We won't need to touch it. You can see it's here. It's this green icon. We don't need to touch that. We don't have ASCOM switches. We don't have ASCOM flat, flat panels. We're not going to bother with the... Well, I will. I'll turn on the weather because I've got it. Um, but we don't need to worry about the weather. It's just a... A driver that connects to a service that you subscribe to to give you the weather. Um, it's a free subscription, but you have to set it up. Now, whilst we do have an automated dome, this software doesn't need to worry about it because the dome is listening to the telescope and it will continually make sure that the dome is pointing in the right direction for the telescope. So we don't need to worry about the dome, so we're not going to connect that. And we don't have any ASCOM safety gear. So we don't need to worry about that. So that's this tab, the equipment tab. It allows us to connect all the equipment and allows us to control all the equipment, but we're not going to use it to do any of the control. We're just going to use it to set up and connect initially. Okay, I'm now going to take you through some of the other tabs. Now, most of these tabs for um, exoplanet observations, we're not really going to use, but I'll just give you a quick tour of Nina so that you understand what's going on and how it can be used. We'll go even deeper on the areas where you will be, the areas, these tabs that you will be using. So the Sky Atlas, um, it's really just a way of searching for objects and you can um, set things like the distance to the object from the moon, their apparent size, their altitude and so on. So if I wanted something that was 50 degrees high and you can then select the type of object, so bright nebulae, um, clusters with nebulae, dark nebulae and so on. Just search a few of these. There we go, that'll do. And then you can do things like order by size or um, constellation, surface brightness, and so on. And let's do object type. And then we just hit search. Now it's got its own catalog built in of deep sky objects. And it's going to search those deep sky objects and it will give us a list. Now, what's happened is it gives us a little picture of the object. Uh, and it gives us a nice little graph here. This graph shows a number of things. It shows um, the hours of darkness, nautical twilight, and um, civil twilight. This 
sloping graph is telling you when the object, or oh, sorry, the altitude of the object at a particular time of day. So this is midday, this is midnight, and then this is midday. So you can see what's happening to the objects. This object starts low and it gets higher, same as this one, but this one starts higher and gets lower. And you can use this to uh, set up your observing session, but we're not going to use this. If you wanted to go to, say, this object, this looks like the um, part of the Val Nebula, then you could slew to the object, um, or you could add the target to a seat to the sequence, or you could set it to the framing system if you wanted to do it over a mosaic over a number of frames. That's all I'm going to say about this particular um, section, this guy, at least, because we're not really going to use it. The framing, again, it's not something we're going to use, but let me just show you how that works. If we was to take this object here, we could set this for the framing assistant. It's loaded this object in, and now we can do things like say, well, OK, I actually want two vertical panels. And I can set things like um, how much offlet, offset to have in order to take this image. And then it would allow me to then send this. Or I can slew it, or I can um, add it as a target, and it will then add both of these imaging sessions, in session one, session two, to the um, to the targeting to the sequencer. Okay, the flat wizard is really about making good flats. You have to prepare your telescope for those flats. Um, by putting a t-shirt over the front or um, an opaque opaque flat panel and having it nicely illuminated and then this will work out exactly how to do the, what, what exposures the flats are needed um, we'll probably set up the flats for you so that you don't have to worry about doing this the sequencer and the imaging tabs are quite important and I will come back to those after I've just described the options and the plugins. So the options tab is not something you want to play with. There's no need to play with it. It will all be set up for um, the observatory. Um, so I would suggest that you don't touch the options tab at all. And the plugins is the same. You shouldn't need to change it. If it has a little number in a corner like this, it means that some of the um, options need updating. And you can have a little download um, thing by them if these plugins need updating. Um, you can check for updates or you can update all, or in the top right hand corner, you can update manually. You might also notice in this very top corner on the top on the um, status bar it says there's a new version available uh, I've subscribed to the nightly feed so that I can always have the very latest version if I want it um, this won't come up very often if it is there I would ignore it I think that updating the plugins is possibly something you might want to do it's reasonably simple it's best just to click the update all button that will then go off, get the um, updates for those plugins, and more than likely it will want you to uh, restart Nina. Now I've got a very bad internet connection, so I will skip this bit. But if you do have a number here, it might be worth just doing the um, update or the internet access. At the observatory is much better than than in my observatory okay so now we're going to talk about the sequencer the sequencer is the heart of nina whilst nina can manually control all of your equipment by taking your input it's really designed to automatically control your equipment taking the input from a sequence of commands and these commands will automatically load for you 
for exoplanet observations. <clears throat> so you won't need to um, create your own sequences. It will, it will be a sequence in it when you turn it on. The first thing that that sequence will do is connect the equipment. Um, so if you, if these are quite easy to read, um, but it can be quite overwhelming when you see all this stuff on the screen for the first time. So the first thing that's going to happen, it's going to wait until nautical dusk, and it will just not do anything until it reaches nautical dusk. It's then going to connect the equipment, and then it's connect, going to connect the camera. It's then going to connect the filter wheel, and it's going to change the filter wheel to a filter. In this case, it's the focus filter. You could change it here to something else. We will set up <coughs> the appropriate filter to use um, for exoplanet observations. You won't need to touch that. It will then connect the focuser. It will then connect the telescope. It will then unpark the telescope. It will set the tracking to sidereal, just in case someone's messed with the tracking. It will connect the guider and in my case it also connects the weather service and then if you haven't already started cooling the camera it will then start cooling the camera now all of these will happen reasonably quickly with the exception of cooling the camera it's going to stay there cooling the camera until it reaches its target temperature i'll show you if your observation is about to start and you want to start it with a warmer camera and carry on cooling as the observation continues I'll show you how you can skip this later it's a little bit um, idiosyncratic I guess and then the next thing that it will do is it will slew to a position and I've just set this so it's the same for everything that I do. It slews to 70 degrees with an azimuth of 90 degrees and it runs the autofocus. It's daytime, so I can't show you that. I shall, read, I shall record some stuff of this happening at night time, but it will run autofocus. Once it's focused, it will then do a solve and sync. So basically it'll look to see where it is and it will then tell the um, telescope driver, this is my location. By doing that, it now knows exactly where it is. And because it knows where it is, um, it can then move on to the following things. So remember we had chosen an object we said hat p6 beam is going to be the object that we were going to observe if we go into nina when we get to this exoplanet sequence we have this little download button this will go off to the internet and it will find all of the exoplanets available tonight and we have to now select our exoplanet that we've chosen which will be in the list almost certainly. Um, hat P6B is the one. There it is, it's right at the top. You can see a number of things have happened here that it's populated. It's told us the magnitude of the object, the depth of the transit, the RA and deck. It's also produced a little graph. And that graph also has the, um, the transit drawn on it for us. So we can see that it's starting in twilight, um, but the first transit is going to be in darkness. <clears throat> We're going to get to the meridian at about just after the looks of things. Um, it's exited transit. There's a little button here you can click, which just overlays the altitude of the moon um, onto that uh, graph but you don't really need it this just gives you a confirmation of what's going on so you've now told it what the target is so what's going to happen <coughs> is um, 
the first command says wait until it's 30 degrees above the horizon. That's just something that I've set because I don't want to use my telescope below 30 degrees. It's then going to unpark the telescope. And I hear you saying we've already done that. We can unpark and unpark telescopes. It's not really a major issue. And we're going to set the tracking again. I hear you saying we've already done that. If you did forget to cool the camera and you hadn't done it earlier or something's happened, it will start cooling the camera again. And then it's going to do this slew and sensor. Now you, you might be asking, well, how does it know where it's got to go? And it knows where it's got to go because all of this is contained within this target command. It's nested within it and it knows the coordinates. So it will slew to where it thinks it is. It will take a picture. It will plate solve that picture. And then it will slew again and it will plate solve that picture and it will slew again and plate solve that picture until it gets the target to within the desired accuracy. Now, I've set mine up to be within six arc seconds, which is pretty accurate given that the seeing is about two arc seconds. Or for the observatory telescope, we'll set that much wider. So once it's done that, it will start the next stage. Remember, we already focused earlier on, so we won't refocus. But what this is doing is saying, if the filter has been changed, then, read, then do another autofocus. So this is just a belt and braces thing. If you fiddled with it and decided, oh, no, we do want the red filter and you change it to the red filter, perhaps you did that manually, then this sequence will recognize you change it, that the, the fil filter has changed and it will do another autofocus using the red filter. OK, there's an opportunity also in the sequence here for you to change the filter. Um, you don't need to worry about that unless, unless you want to change it. I recommend you probably don't. Now, because I found my mount is more accurate than guiding software, especially if a cloud comes over, I found that my guiding software can lock onto a onto some hot pixels, and then effectively it's not gu no longer guiding, and it's well, it's it's forcing the guiding out. I've turned my guiding off for um, exoplanet transits, so I stop guiding. When, when I'm doing it on my equipment, I don't guide, but we will on the Crayford Observatory equipment. And then it'll wait until the start of the observation. It's quite possible that you want to start it early because you've got there and it's set up. I'd recommend starting early, and I'll show you how you can do that whilst keeping this start of observation in here, which is quite nice. You can do an offset here, so you can say minus 60 minutes, for instance which I might add an offset for you to sort of cover starting, say, 20 minutes early. Perhaps we'll do that. Perhaps I'll do that on this one as well. That's quite a good idea. Um, but I'll show you how you can override every one of these commands, either in the sequencer or on the main imaging page. From there, we're going to start the imaging. Now, we've got this trigger. And what this does is after each image has been taken, it will plate solve it to check that it's still, in my case, will be within one arc minute of the of where of the center of the chip. If it deviates, then what it will do is it will stop the exoclock observation or a po it will pause it. Let's say it will do another center and sync, and it will keep center and syncing until it's got the object back in the center of the field, and then the transit observations will continue so it's just a belt and braces thing if someone goes into the observatory and leads on the leans on the telescope by mistake in the middle of an observation it will automatically recognize that's happened recenter and sync and carry on the observation you'll lose 10 minutes of observing and hopefully that won't be important to the end result these loop conditions are things that are checked um, continually and if they no longer apply, then it will um, stop the observation. So for my conditions, I don't want to go below below 30 degrees. So if it goes below 30 degrees, the observation is aborted. Probably won't have that. We'll probably have this set to zero at the Crayford Observatory. 
to give the most flexibility. And then we have this other one, which is basically carry on observing until the end of the observation. And the end of the observation in this particular case is 1.13 UT and 45 seconds. You can add an offset if you want to extend it, but there isn't really any need. And then we actually do the observation. Now, what's happening is this is going to keep looping around. That's what these loop conditions do. They basically say, keep doing this exposure here all the time that we're um, observing. And so we're going to take one image. And I've set this for 120 seconds. So this is the thing that you might need to change depending on the um, brightness of the object. You might need to change it to say five seconds or um, 60 seconds. The filter that you want to observe in, you can then set um, the binning, which I'm suggesting you don't change. And I'm suggesting you don't change anything here. The only thing you ever need to change is the time. Don't change the number. Don't change any of this stuff. It's just there because it's programmed to be there. All you need to change is this one here. And then when it does get to the end of the observation, because one of the loop conditions um, is no longer true, it will then move on. And it moves on to the last part, which is the stop the guiding, park the telescope, warm the camera, and then disconnect all the equipment. And that's the end of your observation. This has been quite a long video and quite a lot to take in. So in the next part, we will look at this sequence running and you will see exactly how it works and how you interact with it. That will be part three.